Well, praise the Lord, saints of the Most High God. This is Brother Jerry again, and we are coming back for our weekly Bible study. Uh, we are in an exciting study about the uh, school of deliverance and demons, and we're studying out of Derek Prince's book, How to Expel Demons what you need to know about demons, your invisible enemy. And we've been studying this for the last uh, six weeks or so because we really want to equip the people of God to be able to do what Jesus assigned each and every one of us to do. We say, well, what is that, Brother Jerry? Well, let me tell you, we've been using three foundational passages of Scripture. Uh, first of all, Let's start with Christ himself. We do know that everywhere he went, he healed the sick and cast out demons. Then we read in, Matthew, I mean Mark 3, 14, uh, where he sent the 12 out. Then we read in Luke 10, where he sent the 70 out. And then we read in, in Mark 16, where he sent the multitudes out. <clears throat> the multitudes out. So Christ cast out demons. He told the 12, cast out demons. He told the 70, cast out demons. And he told all of us, cast out demons. So um, there's no way that we could read the New Testament account of the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and also the gospel of Christ. There's no way that we can read the New Testament and walk away thinking that demons aren't real, that demons aren't still here, and that demons aren't still tormenting people as well as seducing the people of God. Amen? There's no way we could look at the New Testament scriptures and conclude that there are no demons. Amen. And then we learned quickly over the past six weeks or so that not only are demons here um, that are born again, spirit filled, Holy Ghost baptized believer can be demonized, have demons that torment them in their life, torment them in their walk. And no matter what they seem to do, they can't seem to get lasting freedom. And so we've been studying this book to walk through what those various things look like. I'm so glad that the Lord began to deal with me on uh, this whole deliverance ministry uh, some three decades ago now, because this is just real. Uh, this is just real. So uh, I hope you've been enjoying our study. Uh, I'm going to open up with prayer. Then we're going to dive right into our lesson. We're on page 69. We're starting with other lessons I've learned, other lessons I've learned. So let me pray. <clears throat> Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the power of your spirit, we come before you, O Lord God. And we ask that you would give everyone that's listening, everyone that's watching, a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. God, that you would cause us to have wisdom Turn on the light in our understanding, O oh God, so that we can see what we haven't seen in your word and hear what we haven't hear, heard from your spirit. Let us not be ignorant about these things. Several times, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, several times, Paul would say, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And Father, we don't want any of your people to be ignorant about the things that are available to us and the enemies that we fight. So we're asking that you would step in, intervene, teach us by your spirit. He is the teacher. Teach us by your spirit. You promised us that he would teach us all things and even show us things to come. So teach us by your spirit what we need to know <clears throat> about the supernatural realm and what we need to know about demons who live in that realm. In Jesus' name, who is Lord and King, we pray. Amen. 
So let's quickly turn to, to page number 69. We want to look at other lessons that I've learned. Other lessons that I've learned. Page 69, other lessons that I've learned. So the author says here, the deepest and most enduring <clears throat> effect in my own life was the new light that deliverance cast upon the cross. I discovered and experienced that our authority, this is so powerful, that our authority over demons is derived solely from the victory that Jesus won for us by his shed blood, his death, and his victorious resurrection. Did you hear that? Our authority over demons is derived solely from the victory that Jesus won for us by his shed blood, by his death, and by his resurrection. Satan's primary weapon against the whole human race. Satan's primary weapon. Uh, you need to hear this because this, this goes deep. Satan's primary weapon against the whole human race is guilt. G-U-I-L-T. Guilt. This is why he is the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12 and 10. He reminds God constantly and continually that we are all guilty of transgressing God's righteousness and transgressing God's righteous law. Hence, he contends that we have no claim on God's mercy, but are justly subject to God's judgment. Amen. Enemies constantly accusing us. And not only before God, but he also accuses you to you, makes you feel guilty. And if you begin to feel guilty, then you won't operate in the things of God. Because you start saying stuff like, well, I'm not worthy and all of that kind of stuff. Because he makes you feel guilty. Well, we're going to deal with that today. But Jesus, by his atoning death on our behalf, wiped out the handwriting of legal requirements that was against us and disarmed the satanic principalities and powers. Amen. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. I would suggest you meditate on that. As a result, somebody say as a result. <laughs> as a result, as a result, are you with me? We are now justified and have peace with God. We are now justified and have peace with God. Praise the Lord. To be justified, that's Romans 5 and 1. To be justified means to be made righteous with Christ's righteousness, which retains no record of sin, nothing of which to be guilty. See, one thing that the enemy has used in keeping the believer in bondage, first of all, is causing him to feel guilty, like he's not good enough to be God's child, that uh, because of the sins that he may commit at times, that he's no longer the righteous one of God. And so the enemy begins to make him feel guilty to himself, and he condemns he condemns us before God. But listen, we've been justified. Each of us, Arthur says, has been on trial in the court of heaven. And the verdict has been handed down. Not guilty. <laughs> Not guilty. Not guilty. And on this basis, and this basis only, we have the right to exercise the authority Jesus has given us over demons. 
See, we got to settle that right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. We got to settle that. Got to settle the fact that you are not guilty before God. Because if you are still guilty before God, then Jesus did not justify you. If you're not sinless before God, not guilty, then the blood of Jesus wasn't good enough. I dare say it was more than good enough. Amen. And because of what Christ has done, we read in Colossians, it wiped out the handwriting of legal requirements that was against us, disarmed the satanic principalities and powers, and now Romans 5 and 1, we are now justified and have peace with God. Let that settle. Because many times in various denominations, we're taught uh, how to be guilty <laughs> instead of how to be free. We're taught in a way that makes us walk away, always blaming ourselves, guilty if we mess up. You know, you do one wrong thing and now you're guilty and, you know, <laughs> just, just law. Just a letter of the law. And that is not the will of God. Not if, not if Jesus Christ is good enough. Not if his blood was good enough. And his blood was good enough. So through many personal encounters with demons, I have learned that they are not impressed by religious terminology. They scorn denominational labels or ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical status. But when we use the name of Jesus and boldly affirm the words of Scripture that declare his victory won on the cross and the unchallenging righteousness we have received from him by faith. Amen. Then their arrogance and vi vi viciousness begin to melt away. They begin to act like the contemptible creatures they truly are. And we, met, we witnessed a fulfillment of Revelation <coughs> 12 and 1, where it says the believer overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Did you hear that? I really want to stop and preach on that, but we got to keep moving. We need to understand that we've been justified. We need to understand that Jesus has already beat the devil, that Jesus has already disarmed him and made an open show of him publicly, that Jesus is triumphant over the enemy, and that we're to walk out that authority that he's given us. Jesus is not trying to get victory. He already got it. All power in heaven and earth is in his hands. And he tells us to go now and operate in the authority I have. You go and function and occupy till I come. Somebody say amen. On several occasions, I've seen a demon manifest fear in the trembling of the body of his victim. This is why James said the demons believe and tremble. In James 2 and 19, at other times, a demon forces a victim to cover his ears with his hands to avoid hearing the bold proclamation of Jesus' victory on the cross, which is the only and all sufficient basis of deliverance, but is torment to demons. See, I want you to get the picture. When you begin to talk about when you're dealing with demons, you know, I, I command you to come out in the name of the Lord Jesus who gained victory over you on the cross. His shed blood, the blood has set us free and that blood has given, has been accepted by God the Father and because of the blood of Jesus, we have remission of all of our sins and you cannot because of the blood hold me guilty. I am justified and so is this person I'm dealing with. They're justified because they're a believer and you cannot keep them in bondage against their will. I'm telling you, begin to deal with these demons. And when you begin to make those bold proclamations about Christ and the blood of Christ and what that blood has done for you, 
It torments the demons. It torments them. When you say things like uh, um, that you're justified, when you say things like um, you praise the glory of his grace that's made you accepted in the beloved and given you the forgiveness of sins and remission through his blood, demons can't handle that. I'm telling you. So, Understand what the word says about who you are. Understand what the word says about the fact that you're justified. Don't walk around here being guilty, feeling guilty, feeling less than, feeling unworthy. You're not guilty. You're, you're more than less than. You are the head and not the tail. Stop accepting the attack of the enemy to try to make you feel worthless. You're not worthless. You are worth the blood of Jesus being shed on the cross for you. So early in the ministry, back to the book, God impressed me with another truth, the importance of repentance. People who have been taken away or been taken over by a demon and who then commit some sinful act may say, I'm not responsible. A demon made me do it. I couldn't help myself. By this, they imply that they are not guilty and do not therefore need to repent. But in Acts 17 and 30, Paul told the men of Athens, God commands all men everywhere to repent. The phrase all men everywhere leaves no, leaves out no person and no place. Every human being without exception is required by God to repent and accept Jesus as your Savior. The universal reason we all need to repent is that we have all yielded to the rebellious nature we have each inherited from Adam. We are rebels at war with God. We cannot make peace with him until we lay down our rebellion. That is, until we repent. That is the true nature of repentance, to lay down our rebellion. This is not primarily an emotion. It is an act of the will. And here what the author is saying. Air, all men everywhere need to repent. Jesus Christ is Lord, and, and he's calling all men everywhere to repent. Whosoever will, let him come and drink the waters of life freely. Jesus wants everybody to come to him but they have to repent and accept him as their savior and their Lord. Somebody say amen to that. They need to repent. They need to repent. But beyond our universal responsibility for rebellion, each one of us has added our own individual acts of sin and self-will. Sometimes a series of such wrong, sometimes a series of such wrong choices and acts actually bring people to a point that they are no longer able to resist demonic pressure to commit certain sinful acts. What is Arthur saying? Some of us have gotten so um, bogged down and making bad choices that we just open ourselves up for demons. They are literally compelled. Nevertheless, they are still responsible for all the wrong things that brought them to that state of powerlessness in the face of evil. Therefore, they still need to repent. We're still talking about non-believers. They still need to repent. They still need to repent. I don't care if they think they've been kind of good, that they've done good things. They need to repent. All men everywhere need to repent and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. There I discovered two main barriers to deliverance. Failure to repent and failure to forgive others and lay down resentment. Oh, my goodness. 
Once people meet these two requirements, I discovered that I had the authority delegated by Jesus to drive the demons out of them. But I had to determine the boundaries of my authority. Can we get into the meat of it now? Amen. I had heard, for example, about people who, after they drove demons out, cast them into the pit. Was this scriptural? I could find no incident in the New Testament where Jesus cast demons into the pit. Into the pit. If he didn't do it, if you don't see any scriptural reference for it, then you need to stop saying that. I bind you, demon. I tell you to come out and go into the pit from which you came. No, no, that's not biblical. In dealing with the man from Gadara, let's look how Jesus handled it. In dealing with the man from Gadara, see Matthew 8, 28, 32, Jesus did accede to the demon's plea and allow them to go into the herd of pigs but he did not go beyond that. Previously, the demon had asked Jesus, have you come to torment us before the time? Apparently, the demons already knew that there was a set time in God's eternal program for them to undergo their final punishment. But until that time, they would be permitted to continue their present activities. According to Jesus, stayed within the boundaries set by the Father. Accordingly, Jesus stayed within the boundaries set by the Father. See, I'm always amazed when people do things that you can't find scriptural reference for. It says God. If you can't go back to the word of God and find an example or something, I would be leery to hold on to that especially if it's something you think is doctrinal. Amen. Jesus always did the will of the Father, so we can use him as our example. Amen. Because if they could have been cast into the pit, I think Jesus would have did it. But he let them go into the pigs because they asked. And every time you find him casting out demons, you never hear him say where to go. You come out and go, no. He never sent them to hell, never sent them to the pit. So they're still here. I have noticed, I want to serve notice on you. You know every demon that was here is still here. Every demon that was here when Jesus was here is still here. The millions and multitudes of demons, they're still here. Amen. Their time of judgment hasn't come yet. Ah, but it's coming. All right, page 72. International ministry. As I declared the truth of God was teaching me about deliverance, tape recordings of my teachings began to circulate in the United States and in other nations. In 1967, I received an invitation to New Zealand where I conducted my first public deliverance service outside the U.S., in subsequent visits to New Zealand, I have, met, I have met Christians still talking about that service and even some who received deliverance there. <clears throat> Since then, I've conducted public deliverance of services in more than 20 other nations. But one of the most memorable was in 1984 in a remote rural area in the northwest corner of Zambia, in Central Africa. About 7,000 African men and women gathered for a teaching convention at which I was the main speaker. The auditorium was a large natural amphitheater about the size of an American football field, sloping gently downward toward the speaker's platform. The underbrush had been cleared away, but trees had been left standing to provide shade. It was like an open air cathedral with the sunlight streaming through the branches. 
The people all sat on the ground, men, women, old, young, mothers with babies, small children, completely filling the area. I have been asked to teach for five days. So I saw this as a wonderful opportunity <clears throat> to take the people stage by stage through the redemptive plan of God out of the slavery of sin and Satan and to the glorious liberty of the children of God, which you read in Romans 12, 8, 8 and 21. My first message was on the all-sufficient sacrifice that meets the needs of all ages and races, the cross. When I called for those who needed to, to repent, many responded and received salvation. Then I taught them how to pass from curse to blessing. I explained that on the cross, Jesus became a curse for us so that we might inherit the blessings of Abraham, whom God blessed in all things. Galatians 3, 13 through 14. Then I led these Africans who are very conscious of the reality of curses and fear them greatly in a prayer of release in which nearly all uh, participated. Again, I will say more about this in chapter 21. At the end of the message, a well-dressed man came up to me, threw himself on the ground, and rolled in the dust at my feet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, he said. All my, all my life, I've never known a day without pain. Today, for the first time, I am free from all pain. On the third day, I taught them how to recognize the activity of demons and to be delivered from them. At the end, I led them in a collective prayer of deliverance. Amen, somebody. When we prayed the collective prayer for deliverance, these animal spirits began to manifest themselves. I skipped a part. Let me go back a, a, a paragraph. The scene that followed was, to say the least, dramatic. The Africans in that area keep hunters of animals. The Africans in that area, keen hunters of animals, have been taught by witch doctors that in order to be successful, they must open themselves up to the spirit of that particular animals such as a lion or an elephant or a boar that they intended to hunt. <laughs> Unfortunately, often their wives were also taken over by similar spirits. When we prayed the collective prayer for deliverance, these animal spirits began to manifest themselves. There was a cacophony of jungle sounds near the front. A man with a lion spirit attempted to charge me, but another man tripped him and he fell to the ground without reaching me. Several other people, both men and women, dug in the ground with their nose like a boar. A number of women slithered on their bellies on the ground like snakes. One man rolled like a log all the way up the incline to the entrance. I was reminded of the word pandemonium, describing a situation in which many demons are let loose simultaneously. It was remarkable that there was no violence. The name of Jesus was continued on the lips of the workers who were assisting. And after about an hour, the uproar subsided. The supernatural peace that followed led me to believe that most of the people have been set free. Can you imagine that? You're doing deliverance and somebody starts growling or starts acting like a lion or a tiger 
or, or, or roaring at you like a bear or slithering on the ground like a snake. Wow. That's what demons would do when they're in your body and you're going through deliverance. On the fourth day of the conference, my theme was the baptism in the Holy Spirit and how to receive it. After I led the people in prayer, several thousand began to speak in tongues simultaneously. It was awe-inspiring. Then on the final day, I taught the people how to exercise the vocal gifts of the Holy Spirit and led them into the personal ex exercise of these gifts. Now the result was a confirmation of the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 14.31. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. So the conference in Zambia was in many ways the culmination and what God had been teaching me. Deliverance is not an end in itself, but one vital stage without which Christians will never enter into the fullness Jesus intended for them. You hear that? Since that time in Zambia, I have conducted similar teaching conferences in several other nations, including Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkey, and Poland. In each place, I have taught people how to recognize and expel demons. And this has always led to glorious experience of the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit. So because of the pressure of these public conferences, and also because the Lord had led me to place greater emphasis on my writing ministry, I rarely counsel individuals today. Through the printed word, I'm able to help many more people than by one-on-one -on -one counseling. So in the next chapter, I will share some important personal lessons that I learned from ministering to others. So what we learn here, again, is that it is so important, Saint, for us to understand how demons operate. For us to begin to get a a working knowledge of their activities. And we're painstakingly going through this book and the experiences of Derek Prince because they help us to understand how demons function through his own life and ministry. I learned so much from studying some of the tapes that he was talking about. And that's what thrust me into deliverance ministry. And even today, if a demon shows himself to me while I'm talking, I'll bind it right now and, and cause it to be muzzled. And if the Lord leads me to take him through deliverance, I'll do it right then. Amen. Because we have got to make sure we work diligently to set people free. Well, let's go on. At least I'll get into chapter 10. Y'all still with me? See, milk and me. All right? I, I love um, the, the opening of this chapter. So chapter 10, ongoing personal conflicts. In chapter 4 and 5, I related my agonizing struggle with depression and the pride that made me reluctant to acknowledge to my congregation that I had actually uh, needed deliverance from a demon. So this is the man taking people through deliverance who needed deliverance from a demon himself. Also, I had always assumed that a person must be demon free in order to minister deliverance to others. Yet I knew that someone who had been saved through faith and Christ does not have to become a perfect Christian before he or she can testify about salvation or lead others into it. In fact, the enthusiastic testimony of a new convert is often more effective than a sophisticated presentation by a mature believer. <laughs> the same can be true, I discovered, 
in the ministry of deliverance. People who have themselves experienced deliverance from demons are often the most successful in ministering deliverance to others because they know from personal experience the power of the name of Jesus and the word of God. Glory to your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. They can also empathize with them in their struggles. Theological knowledge, on the other hand, can be more of a hindrance than a help. Deliverance is a ministry in which a person must be willing to get his hands dirty. Dealing with directly with representatives of Satan's evil kingdom. If you really get your hands dirty, ah, oh, brother Jay, I won't get my hands dirty. Then you'll never be effective in deliverance ministry. And there'll be people that'll be bound that you're around that you could help, but they won't get any help because you don't want to get your hands dirty. Let that not be your testimony. Page seventy six. The basic requirement for ministering deliverance is stated by Jesus in Mark 16 and 17. And these signs <laughs> will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Jesus required only one thing, simple faith in his name and his word. That's it. This is true whether one is casting out demons out of others or expelling them from himself or from oneself. What do you have to know? That Jesus required only one thing. Simple faith in his name and his word. Because what he said was in these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. You got to have faith in the name. It ain't about you and your power. It's about him and his power. <laughs> it's about his authority flowing through me. He's given me authority over all the power of the enemy. Who? He gave me authority over all the power of the enemy. He did that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is my strength. So I have to have faith in his name. And in his word. Glory to God. Diagnosing the problem of others and helping them to be set free assisted me paradoxically in discerning and dealing with the problems of my own. In other words, you say that because I helped other people, I began to see my own issues better. I soon, I soon, I soon learned two important principles. First, many, perhaps most, problems with demons begin in childhood. Help us, God. Did you hear that? Most problems with demons begin in childhood. Most problems with demons begin in childhood. And when I read that back, back in the day, I began to think about my childhood. And there were things that happened in my childhood that opened up the door for demons to begin to influence me. Lord Jesus, it took me decades to get free because I didn't know. Wow. Second, if a person has persistent or Intractable, intractable problems with demons, there's almost always some root in the occult. In that case, full deliverance will probably not come until this root has been exposed and dealt with. I literally went through that. I couldn't understand some of the things that were going on in my life. And so what I did was I made it a point to ask my mom some very pointed questions about 
the occult. She said, no, 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 I've never dealt with the occult. I said, well, mama, have you ever went to a palm reader? Yeah. Have you ever went to someone that tried to tell you the future or tell you how to handle a problem in your present, whether, whether it's by potions or whatever, wrapping something up in a handkerchief or getting somebody's hair, whatever the case may be. And she said, well, yeah, not me, but I do know people in my family. Wow. So somebody in our bloodline had dealt with the occult. Whether it was voodoo, whether it was hoodoo, I don't care what it was. They dealt with the occult. They had either, you know, um, began to use potions or listen to someone say, well, you know, you'll be able to keep her if you do this and wrap this up, put it up under the porch, whatever. You know, take some of her hair or take some of his hair while he's sleeping and let me tell you what to do with that. All of that is the occult. Wow. And two things he said here. Two principles. Most problems begin in childhood. Most problems with demons begin in childhood. And if you got something that you just cannot get out of, you can't, you know, something that just follows you, follows your kid, follows, follows your mama, follows your grandmama, whatever, follows your daddy, follows your granddaddy. It probably was some demon that entered and the root was in the occult. The author says, both of these principles applied in my own case. Both of these applied in my own case. I was born to British parents, nominal Christians, in India, where I spent the first five years of my life, in accordance with the established custom among the British upper class, my mother soon handed me over to a nanny. And in my case, a Hindu ayah, or ayah, who undoubtedly became the strongest spiritual influence in my early life. I do not remember just what she did, but later, as a young boy, I often had the impression that some evil power was dogging my footsteps. This dark influence followed me through all my early years. In my teens, I formed glamorous images of India as a source of esoteric wisdom on a higher level than the materialistic culture of the West. In my student years at Cambridge, I studied yoga, and even conceived an ambition to become a yogi. Had global travel been as easy then as it is now, I would doubtless have beaten a path to the door of some Indian guru. My field of study at Cambridge was Greek mythology, was Greek philosophy, I'm sorry, and particularly the philosophy of Plato. My two heroes at this time were Socrates and Plato. Then in World War II, I had a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ, as I mentioned in chapter four, and this completely changed the course of my life. From then on, I became an ardent study student of the Bible, but much of my thinking was still influenced by Plato. And I kept some of his writings as works of reference. As I gained further insight into the way people became exposed to demons, I saw that my admiration for Socrates and Plato kept open a door in my personality that made me vulnerable to demonic influence. Socrates himself acknowledged the influence of a demon in his life. As he was dying of hemlock, that he had been sentenced to drink, his last words to one of his associates were, we owe a cock 
to Asacopius. He was ordering that a cock be sacrificed on his behalf to Asacopius, the heathen god of healing. Even though Socrates enjoys great prestige in the intellectual world, his behavior fell into the same category as that of a man sacrificing a cock in a voodoo ceremony. Idolatry is still idolatry, even when described in eloquent classical Greek. I realized also that a similar occult influence pervaded the writings of Plato, my other hero. In his last major dialogue, the Timaeus, he actually acknowledged we have no word from God. So he turned to the occult literature of Egypt for revelation concerning the mysteries of the universe. Again and again, as I sought to help those needing deliverance, I observed the close association between the occult involvement and serious problems of depression. It became clear to me that this had probably contributed to my own struggles against depression when I was a young pastor. So one day in 1970, I was meditating on Deuteronomy 7.26. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it, but you shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. So I walked around my home and realized I had a number of abominations. So I made a decision that I believe had an important bearing on the future course of my life in ministry. I determined not to keep in my possession anything that in any way dishonored Jesus Christ or that opened the door to demonic influence. I rid myself of a succession of items I had inherited from my family, four antique, beautifully embroidered Chinese imperial dragons, and a whole assortment of Chinese antiques, all carrying the emblems of the dragon. I also disposed of items containing elegant Arabic calligraphy, some of which undoubtedly gave glory to, glory to Muhammad and the Muslim god Allah. I also cleared out my library, especially Plato's books, and everything that in any way glorified the occult. Then I threw away a series of poems I had written in the days when I was enamored, or enamored of India. This dramatically changed the spiritual atmosphere around me. It was like passing out of twilight into the clear light of day. I have real concerns for the many Christians slow to recognize God's intense hatred of every form of the occult. Tolerating any kind of continuing occult influence in our lives exposes us to the forces that threaten our own spiritual well-being. I remember when the TV series Bewitched brought the occult into our homes in a way that seemed amusing and harmless. Recognizing its seductiveness, I warned other Christians of the danger of permitting such influences to enter their minds and spirits. 30 years later, occult programs are proliferating on the TV screen and in many cases having a subtle, destructive effect on families. This is no less true of the internet and on a much wider scale of movies, videos, toys, and other forms of entertainment for children. So we're going to stop there. We'll pick up with struggling with fear in our next study. But what we learn here, oh my goodness, about his life that helped us to understand about our own lives. There's certain things we shouldn't allow to influence us. There's certain things that we shouldn't have in our home. I know you may like all of the dragons and stuff on the 
on the porcelain that you bought. But all of those speak of another God. And he will have no other gods before him. We need to clean out our house. <laughs> I remember <laughs> when my kids were younger, back in the day, they had those mood rings. And my kids had those mood rings. I made them take them off and throw them away. Because I'm not going to let some ring tell my kid what their mood is supposed to be. Or to let them know what their mood is. And there was, you know, uh, all this talk about cancer and, and Sagittarius and, you know, all of that stuff. Horoscopes. Got rid of all of that. Because you don't need that kind of influence in the minds, going into the minds of your children or in your mind. Because what it does is it dulls your sensitivity. It dulls your sensitivity down where when demons are actually operating, you don't always see it because you've been dulled, you've been dumbed down by the stuff that they show uh, on television and in these movies. So we have got to stay keen and sharp so that we know how to deal with demons when they manifest and not accept everything as being that's the way that person is. No, we have to stay sharp. The, the believer, the body of Christ, the follower of Christ, we have to stay sharp. So that means there's some things we need to stop watching, some things we need to stop reading, definitely some things you need to stop buying, having them in your house, hanging on your wall. If you want your sensitivity level to increase, then stop desensitizing yourself with stuff that speaks of another God or another belief system. Somebody say milk and meat. I'm just saying you become more sensitive when you focus on the things of God and get out of your face those things that are not of God. Amen? Well, <laughs> I guess I'll stop there. I, I don't want to wear you out. <laughs> this has been a good study. We'll pick up next week. Just remember that as we go through this training and we teach you about how demons function and operate, um, we will give you advice and give you direction on how to uh, go through deliverance, how to go places and get deliverance, how to do self-deliverance on yourself. So we'll, we'll get there. But right now we need to understand the reality of demons and just some of the ways that they function. So stay with us. Stay prayed up. And we'll see you next week.